Today, my guest is Deborah Ruff, a specialist in high intelligence assessment and guidance for both gifted children and adults. Deborah, you've been doing this for over 30 years now, and I kind of discovered you thanks to your medium writings on giftedness, and this is how I learned about your concept of, of five levels of giftedness, and then decided to read the whole book. So just for for you, uh, my dearest audience, uh, Deborah published two fantastic books on giftedness in children. The one that I read is Five Levels of Giftedness, uh, Five Levels of Gifted, sorry, School Issues and Educational Options, and then Keys to Successfully Parenting the Gifted Child. Both titles can be purchased on Amazon, both in paperback and Kindle, and I'm going to show you uh, the links to these books in the description of this video or podcast. So Deborah, you, now you are also working on another book, kind of a sequel to the Five Levels, which will talk about giftedness in adults. And I'm really looking forward to read it. So first of all, thank you for joining me today. No, oh, thank you very much for having me. I have a bunch of questions to you, but perhaps let's start with the whole why behind being passionate about giftedness in children. When I talk to people, uh, parents, but also non-parents, most of the time I get this look of why should we even care? You know, there are so many other pressing issues like cyberbullying, like omnipresent reliance on social media, uh, low salaries of teachers, so many more important, more pressing things. And then I come and talk about recognizing giftedness in your child. So. Why should we bother at all? Why is it important to actually recognize giftedness in our kids? Well, to me, there are many reasons, but one of them is the way school is taught tends to put children together who are the same age. And there is a wide, wide range of ability in, this, in the continuum of people. And if you are there by age, you will have some children who take a long time to learn, and some children, the the majority of the class, will be similar to each other. But the ones at the very top and the very bottom of the learning continuum aren't getting their needs met. Right. And they are less likely to have good friendships easily there, too. And if the parent does not know, or the teacher does not know, the teacher can't do as much about it, really, as the parent can. And when I was younger, lots younger, and my children were starting school, they're all in their 40s now. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, they were starting school, I thought, oh, so... I'll take care of my children now, and then I'll save the world. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't do much to help with policy uh -huh. at that time, but I, that's really what I'm interested in now. And so the way schools are set up really causes problems for the boys and girls who are in a class where they can learn so much faster than others that they... A common issue is I thought I was missing the point. Everyone else understood what the teacher was asking them to do, and I thought, really? That can't be right because it okay. was so easy. Or they already yeah. knew. And so that was part of the beginning of the child who is more intelligent feeling odd, feeling um, wrong, maybe feeling bored, maybe uh, doing too well in school so everybody thinks it's wonderful, but it isn't wonderful because they aren't achieving to the levels they really could. So oh, that's potential, right? Important. Yes. And I do want to make it clear, the second book, the first book is 78 case studies of children at different levels of gifted from the time they were born until however old they were when I wrote the book. Uh -huh. I found 60 of them to talk to me now that they're grown up. Wow, and that is fantastic. book has. And I 
I set it up so that you as adults will see yourself. If you've already raised your children, you can apologize to them. <laughs> and, and really though, and it's true. And and then the other thing is those adult children can read it too because they now are learning more about themselves. So it is the emotional and mental health that you start learning about when you find out your child is gifted. You might not have known you were gifted, but you see your child is gifted, you start to learn about it, and you think, oh no, that was me too. Oh yeah, and on that note, I also, when I talk to some parents who were gifted or were recognized as gifted when they were children at schools, and some of them have very, I won't say traumatic, but bad experiences about that. You know, if it's high pressure um, on delivering good grades or competition, the winning competitions, winning prizes, uh, getting through the accelerated path and uh, having this label of the, the gifted, you know, student who's loved by all the teachers, which is not that cool among, you know, other, other pupils when you are the and only one. Yes, and it isn't what happens to all gifted children either. Exactly. But those who had this experience, those who I talk to, they say that they don't want their child to go through this again. Right. So right. that's why they would rather not recognize any giftedness. Right. They would rather not, you know, get them tested or uh, take care of their special educational needs and, and challenges and rising to their potential because they just don't want them to repeat that story. Right. And unfortunately <laughs> that's too bad a choice <laughs> uh -huh. because it the way i have a, a whole section in my new book that and but you can also go to the website five levels of gifted.com no digits just the words five levels of gifted.com and on the home page you will see what i have written that is on medium Mm -hmm. And one of the things is about the relativity of gifted, and that's an important thing, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that right now. But another, there is one article on there, one story, about how personalities affect how you do in school. And so look for that piece and read it. Okay, we'll yes. link it to the description. Because it helps you see that sometimes school just did not work for you at all, even though you were gifted. Oh, yeah. Yes, and so you feel extra terrible. Mm -hmm. And you lose your confidence. You think you're a loser. I don't know the word in Polish. I don't know any words in Polish, but I. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Of it's, course. It's a person who feels... Um, no one understands them, and uh, they just are a failure. That's mm -hmm. in English. And, and a misfit, I guess, right? A or misfit, also like not yes. Fitting. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And more boys have trouble. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk also a little bit more about that gender uh, gender mm -hmm. gap when it comes yes. to gifted groups. Well, mm -hmm. boys have a, the boys as a group tend to have a higher energy level. Of course. <laughs> yes. And so I wrote a story that came out uh, a few weeks ago about um, seven-year-old boys, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think. That's the title I use. But boys have, have this need to move around. And little girls in the class are like, hello, teacher, what should I do now? And the little boys, when are we done? And when right. Do we, yes. And when do we? And I should tell you, I used to teach elementary school. So I had seven years of teaching children between, I taught children who were eight until 12, ages eight to 12. And I learned, that's before I understood about giftedness. And yet I was a flexible teacher. 
because I I could think of many things at once as okay yes I'm gifted I <laughs> but that's important because sometimes teachers are not flexible and the minds of the gifted children have lots of questions and when they can't ask them and they can't get answers for them and they're told to just do what they are told to do more boys than girls will uh, resist and sometimes they won't do their work and they'll get bad grades because they didn't do their work and that can happen to girls too but one of the things that I was very very fortunate about is a mother who had trouble in school and she was very very smart and she grew up to tell me it's more important that you are learning and that you are happy. You only need to get good enough grades. If you are gifted, you will always pass those tests, the standardized tests, and your grades maybe are not the very top, but they can. it's okay if they aren't, if you learn how to be a good writer and you are doing okay on those national tests <laughs> and and the thing is there's a there's a book about uh valedictorians the people get the very best grades in their class and their when they graduate there is very little relationship to eventual adult success very interesting mm -hmm. and why, why is that so because grades are not about success. In fact, if you spend all your time doing what you are told and getting the grades that you know how, what the teacher wants, you lose your creativity. You lose your power to speak up. You wait for somebody else to tell you what to do. However, you get very well adjusted to recognize what other people want from you. And yeah, and expect. that can be very, very social skills. You. <laughs> <laughs> you can still be uh, good with other people, but you have to be able to to learn. And one of your other questions is about the children who want to save the world when they're only six. Or yeah, seven. that's Ooh. from one of our um, listeners. Yeah, and the thing is, if you tell them if you just get good grades in school. You'll, you'll see, no, <laughs> that isn't connected. It's about knowing what you care about and then really doing all the reading and visiting and talking and learning in school and out. Mm -hmm. So For are you listening. saying that, that nurturing giftedness in children is basically about teaching them about how irrelevant the grades are and how you should be able to do enough, but enough in, in the sense of, you know, passing different stages of education, but nurturing your own uh, yes. talents yeah. and potential, Because right? some people think success is having a, a very important uh, label, president, CEO, uh, founder, uh, or just rising to the top in their business and they may be miserable though we don't want people to be miserable we want them to be well adjusted and you can be well adjusted when you learn what is really important to you so the environment we set up for the children has to include them looking at what are they liking what are they not liking and yes, there's certain things they have to do, but not a lot of grade level stuff. The things that are happening for the other kids their ages may be totally a waste of time. But getting back to this, you mentioned that children, that uh, boys have a lot of energy and even when they are gifted, they sometimes tend to be very stubborn and resist, you know, the request and then they kind of come across as not gifted, but just more nasty and, and mischievous and uh, the problematic children, right? And uh, talking to, to parents here in, in Poland, I, that's that's a common experience, you know, that uh, for children and especially that's about sons 
they tend to not be recognized well, as gifted. I have three sons and two brothers. I have only one, but <laughs> I can tell, you know, I, I feel what you what you are describing here. If you were to, and to imagine you, know, you don't have any teachers at school who could tell you that, hey, maybe your child is not nasty, maybe he is gifted. What would you recommend to uh, parents? What, what signs should they, um, you know, look for? What, how, how can they tell if their child is gifted at this stage of, you know, first, second grade, the beginning of school experience? Um, the um, the website, Five Levels of Gifted, the first article we have on there is about the rough estimates of levels of gifted. And it gives you all these guidelines for seeing where does your child fit. And so it's, it doesn't cost anything. You don't give the child a test. You look at it. You look at what your child is acting like and can do. And it, they don't have to have every little detail that is on the list. These lists are just examples of what the children at different levels or degrees of high intelligence look like. Also, uh, I don't know what you have in, in Poland. Uh, you may have heard of the Myers-Briggs. Of course, I, yeah. Peter? Okay. Um, the Myers-Briggs I gave to everybody in the book. The parents uh, also, also for children? The yeah. Children? Yes, I gave the children's ver version to the children when they were children. And I kept their scores. And then they took the Myers-Briggs when they were over 20 years old. And all their parents had taken it back when they first agreed to work with me on the first book. And so I am able to see which personality types won't cooperate in school. <laughs> so so which are the Yes, you can predict it from the Myers-Briggs. <laughs> and you can also predict who is going to do what they're told to do, who is going to be nasty to you if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> like the teachers or the parents. And I, so I have whole chapters that explain, but I've written pieces already. You can read them free. It, it, the book is just going to have it all right there. But I already have been putting all these pieces onto Medium. And uh, you, you may read three stories on Medium a month, no cost. Okay. So you really can find these things. So the combination of what makes some kids hate school and some kids love school shows up. And getting really good grades just means you are willing to see what the teacher really wants. One of my sons, I, I kind of like this story. One of my sons, who is very smart, uh, when he was in school, he really cared about getting good grades. And I told him not to worry so much. He would do fine. And he said, but he would in the, in the fall, at the beginning of the school year, every year he'd be in tears. It's so hard. I don't know how I'm going to learn this. And I said, you say this every year. And he said, I do. And I said, yeah, every year, within a month or two, you know what's happening and you have no trouble. And he, so we relaxed a little bit. And he said, well, but sometimes I don't get a good grade on the test that the teacher made. He did well on the state tests and the country tests, but not on the teacher tests. And teachers don't always know how to write good tests. That's true. Yeah. And uh, so he said sometimes on essay questions or uh, multiple choice, I choose the wrong answer or I I don't know what they want me to say. Uh -huh. and I'll tell you what they want you to say. They want you to say what they said in school. And he said, are you serious? You mean just regurgitate what they've said? <laughs> and I said, yeah, sad, but true. And I said, so if you can remember what the teacher said and what was in the chapter you were told to read, put that down. But he was trying to interpret it. He was trying to make it more meaningful. Than Creative just, to add some yes. extra value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for a gifted child to be told they don't care about that, 
<laughs> that's that's not... heartbreaking, to be mm-hmm. honest, because this is what you yeah. want to show to the world, right? Yeah. That you can do something, something new, yes. something yes. creative. And it does get better. Uh, the way the schools work, mm-hmm. everywhere from what I can tell, they start with everybody in the same class by age, but then as time goes by, they move the children who are ahead If they've cooperated, they're more likely to be there, sadly, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, but they they are there uh, with more children like them, and they also get the teachers who are clever enough in the subject to teach that subject. Yeah. There actually are different IQs for all the majors in college, university. <laughs> in other words... For instance, people who have majored in the humanities are very smart. Uh huh. And when you get an elementary school teacher or a high school teacher and they've majored in English or the humanities or history uh, or math, different maths and sciences, they may not be uniformly highly intelligent, but they may be. And so there are more of them by the time your child is getting older. Of But, course, high school teachers tend to be more like broadly yeah. referred to different domains and have mm-hmm. just broader mm-hmm. horizons. Yeah. So it usually it's the earlier grades that cause the most trouble for the gifted kids. Is it important that we, as parents, that we recognize giftedness in our children at the very early stage of development, like when they are like yeah. five, six, seven, or can we wait? I, yeah. Is it fine yes. to wait? <laughs> Absolutely, five, six, seven, and it isn't for academic reasons. It's for social and emotional reasons. They they can learn no matter where you put them if they're allowed to. But if you put them in a class where they're not allowed to learn what they are ready to learn, it's going to be very confusing and angering to most kids. Also, they're wasting time. <laughs> another one of my kids. Yeah, that, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another one of my kids came home from kindergarten. The, the very, you know, he was five or six. And I said, well, how was it? And he said, well, mom. Frankly, it just takes so much of my time. <laughs> That's what my son says every day. That yeah. he says, I need life, you know? Yeah, it just takes And so he's much right. He's time. right. And so it depends on what your laws are, what you can do, because knowing what level of gifted your child is, you will know what would be best. And so you- can we maybe... Yeah, sorry, but at this moment, I would love to to ask you this question about the differences between needs of um, different levels of giftedness. So uh, just for our audience, it's best to read on Medium, on your Medium, what exactly the different levels of giftedness are. But the concept yes. is, yeah, maybe you can briefly just tell what that yes. underlying yes. thesis um, is. And in this book I'm writing now, which is hard. It's hard work. <laughs> it's taken a long time because I have to think. You know, it's like just a bunch of facts. I have to interpret what I'm finding from the people I've interviewed and gotten questionnaires back from. But um, levels one and two are the normal gifted. They're, they're the kind of people, everybody has met people like that. And... Uh, They are ahead, they learn quickly, but they aren't um, they aren't like way, way, way far ahead. They they fit. They're more like them in the classroom. If there are 25 children in the class, there will be two or three or four who are in levels one and two, maybe even more. You get to level three, you're talking about uh, highly to exceptionally gifted. And those children, kind of on the line between uh, conventional, conventionally gifted, and outliers. Mm-hmm. Levels four and five are outliers. And they will not fit a regular classroom throughout elementary school. And if you make them be there, 
you will have all kinds of emotional and behavioral problems. And they might not show up right away. They might show up as the child grows and they get a mis a misinterpretation of who they are. Sometimes they think they're too important. Sometimes they think they're missing the point. What What is going on with the world? Other times they feel like the teachers and their parents don't understand them and they're it's crazy to even try and talk to the adults. <laughs> there's so many things that can happen. Uh, there's no one thing. I, I just wish it were easier for all of us, but it's very complex. But levels four and five are, except level four means they're very, very, very high, but not as high as level five in everything but they are really high in at least one thing. And we shouldn't spend too much time on those other things. Let that child soar in that one or two things and make sure they're just good enough in those other things. But what happens in schools, they work on the parts the kid is not good at. Mm -hmm. To kind of like even out the differences, yeah. right? Yeah, well, you can't. You won't ever even it out, and you'll just confuse the child so he or she does not know what they want to do for their career. Do you say here, like, do, do I hear correctly that you advocate for children knowing well from the start that they are, they are gifted, that they are gifted, and this is who I am, this is what I need, and even if I'm just six or seven years old, I yeah, and I feel different and odd. Should yeah, I know yeah. it as a child or should I be kind of protected by my parents? What is your take here? Uh, well, they need to know, but they don't need to know badly. Uh-huh. Where, where do you there's, uh -huh. It's kind of like talking about sex. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a title of our today's conversation. No, I know. But it's, it's like <laughs> you have to figure out what the child needs to know now. Okay. And they don't need to know everything now but when it comes to giftedness they need to know they were very fortunate lucky that they that they had uh they were born with a brain that makes it easier for them to learn more faster than many people but they didn't earn it it isn't like yeah it was a gift it isn't like who they are it, it And so it gives them the ability to learn more and faster, which means they also can learn how to do more things like just normal things like cooking and fixing things and uh, taking care of animals because they don't need as much repetition to learn basic things. So they must understand this is not... The first time my children were in a school where they brought all the gifted kids and their parents together. Well, no, I guess the kids weren't there. The parents, well, you are all wonderful people. You have gifted children. And I thought, oh, no, 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 that's not what you, we didn't earn this. Don't treat us like we're special. It's not about special. It's about what are my children's needs. And the needs are to be able to keep learning at the pace and depth they are capable of doing that and being around other children who get their jokes, who know how to be silly together, who know how to compete, uh, how to help each other, social skills, depending on the level of gifted. Sometimes in the early ages, Levels four and five, their best friends will probably be grown-ups. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I could, you know, absolutely tell that to children of other uh, parents who listen to my podcast, they say, my kid is friends with grown-ups. When we meet with our friends who also have children, he or she sits with us at the table and we have a grown-up conversation while the other children are playing uh, some, some children's games. Yes, and... And so sometimes you can find other really gifted kids who 
would you want to be sure they're safe individuals uh, before you leave your young child alone with anybody. Of course. Uh, but it is it is important that uh, older gifted children can also become uh, friends, appropriate friends for some activities or tutoring uh, because they they will enjoy the child who is clearly gifted and knows so many things and is so excited about life. And so, yeah, it's important for them to know. I have one person in the book. It's all pseudonyms for the people. And uh, one, this one person, his, his mother said, you can do anything you want, but she didn't really ever tell him his IQ. She never explained giftedness to him. And he, but by the time he grew up, he was so unhappy, so confused about his life. And I had reached out to him and wanted to interview him. And he said, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm interested. And I said, well, if you've got questions about yourself, you can ask me. It won't cost you anything. And he said, well, could I get my IQ? And I said, I'll send you the report. <laughs> I'll send you the report. And he said, all right, I'll talk to you then. And he said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. and he's a level five. So he has never seen it before? His, his no. parents have he never seen it? He knew he was smart, but he was thinking, what good is it? He was miserable. Uh -huh. And so it was, he didn't know what to ask for. You know, being a smart kid does not mean you know exactly what you need of it course takes... you're the yeah, you still yeah, don't know yeah. what it's all yeah. about right? and so yes it's important for them to know but don't turn it into an honor turn it into an explanation of why well my the first chapter in the new book that you don't have yet is relativity and i did give a nice short part of it on medium so you can find it, relativity. But this one woman I knew uh, was a friend. Uh, she didn't get to go on to university because her family did not have enough money, and they sent her brother, but not her. And many people think if they didn't go to university, they aren't smart. No, but that's not... How it, it's not how it works. You just know more if you've had a good education. Uh -huh. uh, but she was in a job where she was always annoyed with her fellow workers. And she said, they don't even try. They don't even try. We do, we're supposed to do this and we're supposed to do that. And they don't do it. They just don't do it. And I said, you don't understand how smart you are compared to these people. And, and she she knew her IQ, and, but she didn't know what it meant. And so I, I told her, but she was already in her 40s when that happened, and she was so stuck believing she wasn't gifted. Wow. Yeah, and so it, it can be very damaging. That's so devastating, mm -hmm. you know, like if you have somebody who is basically going through, through their most fruitful years, young years, without relevant self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. And I've had, uh, it's interesting because as you get more experienced, you recognize other gifted people. Yeah. Just can tell. Uh, it's easier to tell. The, I My kids have said to me, well, so-and-so seems smart, but... <laughs> and I, you know, you can't really tell until you're on a committee with someone. <laughs> but it really is about how to to keep yourself in the right social zone to be courteous to others and not expect them to be like you. They may be smarter. They may not be as smart. That doesn't make them not... Uh, a good person. It's just how do you pace your conversation? 
What are your expectations of someone else? Uh, all these things help us know ourselves and our place in the world. Right. That's also like I, when you talked about um, boasting about parents or like being proud about the, the giftedness of, of the children uh, at the school setting, I thought that uh, it's actually something really bad for the whole concept of giftedness and the debate or discussion about it is that we treat or some some people treat giftedness uh, of the children as kind of like a trophy that you can you know, show around and somewhere mm -hmm. it gives you a pass to some elitist educational organizations, clubs, and so on, that are close to most other people. And then the whole gift concept of giftedness is not about self-discovery and development, but rather about belonging to uh, influential circles or, you know, yeah. like people who can do more or who are in power. Well, and most of the world has uh, what I have learned to call forced poverty. Uh -huh. What do you mean by that? I mean that not all countries have uh, a social safety net. Of course, uh, yeah. Yes, and when there is not a social safety net and uh, there is racism and there is uh, caste systems, there are people of high intelligence in those groups, but they never get access. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's a, that most people, it, I didn't know this. I mean, it, I'm fairly recently realizing how many people in my book, and I just have a, a group of very um, similar people as far as uh, they, none of them has been uh, marginalized for their race or their uh, ethnic background, but uh, some of them do not have a lot of money. And so if they were raised to think, because you are so smart, you will get to go to that school or that school, and then they can't afford that school, and that school is not going to give them a, a free ride. The, the school won't let them in unless they pay and they don't get a scholarship. Then there is bitterness. So there is so much to learn about the big picture of high intelligence. And remember at the beginning I said, just take care of your own child is what I used yeah. to say. I don't think that anymore because the whole system is designed to make it very hard for some people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think if we think we're better because we're smart or we were very lucky, then we are not being helpful to the needs of others at all. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that, that does. No, absolutely. I can, I can totally agree with what you're saying here. And well, that's a way too to keep your child humble as you are discussing the abilities. Yeah. Like, so my experience, in, so we, we got our son tested when he was the end of first grade. So he must have been like almost eight or almost seven around that time <laughs> anyway she was really curious about what his results were and what the whole fuss was about because it was three or four meetings you know a lot of tests and quizzes to do and she really liked it by the way and uh, it's very it, fun it's like playing game for a smart kid however when he left the, the the room he was so hungry and you know so excited and i could see that he was just boiling with all this uh, stimuli that, that got into him and it was really interesting to observe him but anyway, he was very curious about what it was what it was all about, and when we got the the report from the from the test, uh, I decided to show it to him because you know you spent six hours there, so you, you had the right to know. <laughs> uh, but then uh, I told him, "No, this means that you have a very fast processor as as a computer. Your your internal CPU is extremely fast. Really good so idea. Your, your memory card is." normal <laughs> your memory is normal <laughs> yeah. uh, so he's he's vt in terms of you know computer science and programming so all these uh, metaphors from the from from the computers the world of computers were uh resonating with him uh 
but still, like, you know, I can see that he gets very often frustrated with other people that they get slower or that they, that he has to wait for them until they finish some exercise. But then we always have this discussion, you know, telling him that, look, you're in, in 98th or 9th percentile. So in your life, most of the people around you will be slower. And this is how it's going to work. You need to, not, not them, but you need to learn how to wait because nobody's going to get faster just because you are frustrated. The only thing you can do is just to surround yourself with, with people who are similar, but I believe only... everybody should know about everybody. I'm not, I want a, uh, timing in Ned's life to be around others who are just the whole spectrum of people and learners and at the same time, when they're learning math, they should be with other people who are learning math at the same rate. Yeah. And when they are in a, a discussion class about philosophy or English literature or Polish literature, uh, they should be with people who can also discuss it. Of course. Because they will not get as much out of it if they aren't. But they can take art classes and music classes and... Uh, physical education and sports. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things they can do where being with other children their age is a fine thing. Yeah, you know, it's it's easier when you are the, the older you are, you know, high school level, middle school level, it's easier to kind of find uh, classes, schools that have um, more children who are at the yes. same level. But this early, early classes of uh, primary school is just really sometimes it's really difficult for for parents to find a school where you have at least one well similar and with, student. Levels, with levels four and five in particular you should just take them out of school they aren't going to find a school. and with the uh levels three it's like this you can find a really a school that more children like that will be in and that will help also the average IQ of teachers varies with the kind of school. You have smarter teachers in college prep schools than you do in uh, the schools that cater to, um, well, I, I don't want to be too broad in saying working class because th sometimes there are people in the working class you know, the blue collar. Who are work. gifted, yeah. Gifted. They just didn't have the same opportunities or encouragement. And uh, I I was fortunate. I went to a public school uh, that had the cross-section of people. We, we did not have any other races. It was a very racist school, but I didn't know it. It was back in the 50s and 60s. And so I didn't know that, but the poverty level, there were poor kids, there were wealthy kids, and my two of my very best, a bunch of my best friends were not wealthy at all because we were all in the same school. So we found each other by our similarities, not our social class. Uh -huh. And when schools are set up too much by social class, it... It causes problems too, of course. Yeah. Ugh. So it, and it, it filters it, out the whole diversity of of, of ranges that you could yes, encounter in the normal in all kinds random of random setup. Yeah. Yeah, and then you have to look at um, just physical properties. Is it a very tall kid? Is it a very small kid? <laughs> because it makes it harder sometimes to accelerate a very small child. If everybody though, else is super yeah, tall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's, okay, next question. <laughs> okay. So now I have a couple of questions from, from the audience. Uh, the one is that we um, already touched on is about the, um, a very young gifted child. So we're saying talking six, five, six years, who feels this devastating internal pressure to to solve global issues. So the, one mom told me about her, her son who is so preoccupied and worried about the climate crisis, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, 
the immigration crisis, uh, the nukes, and you know, worried whether Putin's gonna nuke Poland. Uh, but obviously, he is not equipped at this age yet with uh, solving Are these issues. Equipped? I'm not, are you? <laughs> but yeah. anyway, you know, you have this. How? What would your advice make to to? What would you advise that to the mother? How can she help her child deal with that internal pressure? Yeah, you know, if if you've read uh, one of my favorite authors when my children were young was Linda Silverman. Oh, I love her. Yeah, and Linda Linda talked about that issue. Okay. And, yes, and it's very common. Certain personality more, certain personalities uh, are more likely with the high giftedness to uh, be really concerned, but mm -hmm. uh, it's it can happen to any personality where they feel this way, and so what you have to do is listen, let them know how you deal with it. Because some of these problems will take a long time to solve. And we are so, but you can assure the child. But so many of us know these problems. We are, we are worried and concerned too. But because we have more experience and more age and wisdom, we can come up with what we can do. And in my case, we would say, I'd this about the climate or I do this about the politics or I do and tell your child that we unfortunately it takes you know that phrase it takes a village we all have our different strengths and weaknesses and when people work together each one can contribute something to solving a problem and then you've you also need to get into the existential issue for the yeah. child. And that's where you slowly but surely, depending on what the child seems ready for, is talk about the cycle of life. Uh -huh. We're all born, we all live, we all die. And uh, it. I don't believe in a cruel creator. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so it's going to be okay. It is going to be okay. But in the meantime, part of what makes life very fulfilling for us is figuring out how to contribute to solving a problem. And so ask him your or her, ask that child, what would you say is the one thing that has you the most interested in solving that problem. And then give them a chance to do more reading on it. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, go look at war videos when you're six or yeah. seven. Huh. But to talk about a little history about how people have solved other wars. Uh, my, my child, who had these questions at very young age also, eventually... He wanted all the uh, journal books of the Civil War uh, commanders and generals, and he read them. He read disaster books. He, you know, and then when he had disasters, he was very worried for a while. You talk about the age difference. Yeah. We were driving through Chicago, and... Uh, we had we lived in a more rural area, so Chicago was a big deal. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we were talking about he was probably four or five, maybe six, uh, four or five. And anyway, we were driving through, and my husband and I were talking about, well, should we take a road outside the city and take the long way, or should we take the highway? Well, he, my son was so worried about going on a highway because he kept, are we going on the highway? Are we going on the highway? And eventually he said, why are you so worried about this? He said, well, couldn't we fall off? <laughs> and so you, sometimes you don't know what it is that's worrying them the most. Oh, and yeah. Ask. It might come, you know, with very vivid imaginations. They can yeah. just imagine what 
might go wrong. And this is what keeps them worried. And he was worried about, there was a big flood back in uh, more than a hundred years ago called the Jones flood. And he, it, it was a flash flood. And so he was worried about flash floods. So you just have to talk about, let them talk about what part of that worries them and what can people do and what are people doing to prevent future flash floods. Mm -hmm. and, and that just makes him feel heard and calmed and also inspired. So that's that's how I recommend that people go at these things about they're not old enough to solve the problems, but they need well, that's their... that's very empowering what you are saying because you know very often uh, that, that mom particularly she said that she was worried that the child at this age has this exist these existential um, thoughts and, and you know issues and yes, he thinks, thinks about such things. He's while level as four a child, five probably. <laughs> yeah, but while as a child he should and then comes this normative, you know, expectation of what children should be doing. He should be playing, you know. Uh and, and this this disproportion between what is actually happening and what the culture teaches us about what the children should be doing is is for many parents it's really hard to somehow, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together. When your child is unusual, uh, yes, all the friends around you, many of them are gifted also, but they may not be that gifted. Yeah. And so they think it's wrong to even have your child talk about it. Yeah, and you as a parent probably showed him some, you know, bad images, and this is your fault that he now cannot yeah. sleep, right? Yeah, and yet if you have a child who is an existentialist at five or six or seven, that is an indication of incredibly high intelligence. That's not the same as a child who has heard some impressive words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I would have people come to me and say, well, my son's interested in string theory. No, he's heard somebody say it. You know, it's like there's a difference because it, it really, you have to be aware of when they really have a concern or interest, or when they are simply saying what they already saw got them some positive attention. Okay, let's move to another question. Uh, that's actually there was a bunch of questions that related to the same issue. So, what should you do when your child loses interest and motivation to pursue their um, passions at the age of? 10, 12, so then they, when they start being teenagers. So a couple of parents uh, have said that this is what they are dealing with and they really don't know how to react, that their child loses any interest in street theory or whatever else was their, their passion before. Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you do? Because I saw clients for 20 years and it was families. And I'd say, well, what I would say is, I, we're supporting this interest of yours, and if you want a break, fine. You can try something else, and we'll support that. But if you're not going to practice or you're not really paying attention, we're not going to keep paying for the lessons. So I ultimately say to the child who's pre-teens and so on is, you can do it when you're a grown-up. You know, we're willing to pay for it now, but if you want, if you aren't sure this is really interesting to you, you don't have to do it. And the thing is, they really need to know that. Sometimes parents get too invested in their pride over their child's interest or challenge. And That's the true. kid senses that. And they think, I'm, you, you like that I do this. I'm not enjoying it anymore. And, and let them quit. Just let them quit. Yeah. I think it's for many parents, as you know, it, it's not what they want to hear. But uh, can you tell? Can you talk, talk a little bit more about why this happens? So you said that one motivation might be because uh, the child does something to make the parents happy, not because they want to do it. Uh, are there any other reasons why children, gifted children, might lose their passions and motivation? Same reason you would. I mean, we all lose interest in something we used to really love. And 
Yeah, I mean, it, they they are also trying to test how much you will listen to them. Uh -huh. Are you going to keep forcing an issue, and why? It it isn't important that they keep the. There's a book by Benjamin Bloom. He Benjamin Bloom was the editor of a book called Developing Talent in Young People. And even though it's 20 or 30 years old, it's still relevant. And uh, you should, anybody who's asking that question would get a lot out of that book. And I should tell you my personality. <laughs> I'm an NTP and I've never, I'm, I've learned how to get closer to the F, but I'm not an F. And the F feeler, you know, it's like, okay, all right, so let's move on. <laughs> so for me, the, the first time I did the Myers-Briggs, it was like, I think it was around 10 years ago. It, it showed me, and that was an ENTJ. Uh -huh. So that was, was you know, uh, but when I did it again, I moved towards F in this, uh, it was like thinking, feeling, right? Um, uh, parents. So it's interesting how it does the changes, you know, throughout they do your life. Change, and... But doesn't it make sense? It does. Absolutely. Think about it. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, the children in the book who are now grown up, mm -hmm. I show how many of them did change. Uh -huh. And I didn't test the parents again. But I do know some of the parents said, I've changed since then. And I said, yeah, but I want to just put in there what you were like when you were making all those decisions for the children when they were younger. Like yeah. that? Because that's important. You may uh -huh. have changed. And as I said at the beginning, uh, you might need to apologize to your children. <laughs> <And they're> children. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it is something that changes as people have more freedom to discover who they really are. Yeah, and to, to experiment with different life yes. experience. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's move to another question from 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 a listener. Uh, that is one mother talked about uh, her daughter uh, that refuses to follow a different curriculum for for a gifted child at school, like different exercises, different sets of fine, like homeworks and so on, because she doesn't. But she says she, she wants to be like other children. She doesn't want to do different, you know, odd things. She wants to be like others. I know what she is. Yeah, yeah. that's normal for an extroverted gifted child. Okay. What, is, what, what, what does it mean for the mother? Yeah, she wants to fit it in. Means she's in the wrong place. If you want her to do what everyone else is doing, you've got to put her with other people who are able to do what she d can do. Mm -hmm. So either she's in the environment of children who are like her, and then she has the same yeah. thing to do. Yeah. 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 But I'm telling you, when you've got a girl or a boy who is an extrovert and they are in a group that is not as uh, capable as they are, even in a gifted program that happens, uh -huh. uh, they want to be like the other kids. And so they will, they will go along with what the other kids are doing. And uh -huh. it's not going to, it's not going to be, the ruination of her life and her future, that she's not doing whatever they've been asked to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, school is not real life. I've written a whole series of, of articles yeah. how school is not real life. It's it's so artificial as far as what it how it relates to your real life. Absolutely. And so we shouldn't worry too much, but she's got to be. Res it's important not to be um, rude. Uh-huh. And yes, you don't want the child to uh, be sarcastic or rude or say things to a teacher or other children that makes it sound like the child thinks I'm superior to you. You don't even know what you're talking about. That's not okay. Yeah, and that happens very often, you know, that, uh, I mean, like, I, I know this from my childhood uh, or, or my teenage year, I mean, years, I actually, I had the privilege of attending magnet schools for gifted children, gifted teenagers, but there were some people who were, felt very entitled, and I think it was kind of like, maybe trendy to feel entitled and to show this entitlement, and I did this as well, so I, I, I'm yeah, guilty of yeah. the same, of the same sin, but... Uh, 
but the, there, the there adults, were other models of, of behavior right. you know, like and the adults the adults it is so important you know people would like to say that good training in teaching gifted is important it is but they also need to be gifted yeah might that really, what what's uh what are the possible downsides if you offer a gifted curriculum to a child who is not gifted well okay it, it, everybody has a, what i call well you know on the test they say the margin of error yeah you know your child gets a 130 but he or she really could have been 125 to 135 on the IQ score, okay? And it's the same with our our abilities. When we are, like your son, when he came out of six hours of testing, he was at the top of his ability range because so excited, he was so stimulated. But later, he, he would be very tired. Yeah. And he wouldn't be at that level anymore. So there are different times in your day and your life when you are stimulated enough, you will be changing your brain and working at a higher level. And we have seen that in, um, and you're asking about the not gifted child mm -hmm. who gotten gifted curriculum. Some children you would not have expected to be able to do it can, but if they are around other kids who are more intelligent, Either it isn't really going to work for those more intelligent children, or it isn't going to work for that child. And the child who can't keep up with whoever is around him or her uh, gets a very bad self uh, self uh, identity uh -huh. self concept. So it's actually the same thing that happens for gifted children who are in the environment of uh, much less capable, where they feel odd and and different and crazy and that's why they feel they also experience this lower self-esteem right so they're unfortunately the person Jeannie Oaks who is the one who said we shouldn't ability group for middle school people misunderstood her she said tracking and she was trying to explain you need more flexibility and she no matter what she has said afterwards nobody pays attention they got rid of ability grouping in those middle years, and it's been terrible. And what kids who do the best, it, okay, say you've got leveled classes by lower ability, middle ability, higher ability. When you put everybody together, the children who suffer the most are the low ability children. Oh. Because they just don't see any way to ever be achievers. They just see any way to ever win. Kids at the top learn less, but they still know they're smart and they feel fine about it. Uh -huh. They may be bored, they may be impatient, but they aren't losing nearly as much as those children at the bottom. Uh -huh. And the ones in the middle, they have uh, less of a chance to be the stars of the class. So when you put them all together, these kids everybody are, loses. Yeah. yeah, it it just doesn't work. It does for some subjects that aren't based on intellect and fast learning. Right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> so the, there there is a lot of sense in ability grouping. So in Poland, we don't do ability grouping at the um, neither elementary nor nor uh, high school level. Uh, however, we do have magnet schools at the high school level. So, you know, the schools where you need to have really high scores on your uh, that's exams. High school. To... But that's too late, basically. And you know, it's like when you're 15, you already know what you are. The kids who really rebelled yeah, uh, or tuned out through the middle school years, mm -hmm. they won't get into that school. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because and you so, need to have good grades and you know yeah, great scores and good in your grades exams. Only prove you know what to do with the teacher said and said. Absolutely. 
So you, you have all these, you know, eight years to to adjust to the expectations of the system, which is well, yeah. For and if you're an extroverted child who wants to be like everyone else, if you get invited to be in that program, but your friends don't get invited, you'll say no. <laughs> oh yeah. And that also distances you from from your friends. You know, you don't yeah. have much to to talk about yeah. here. So, so yay for ability grouping. Uh, in Poland, we don't do that. <laughs> so maybe, maybe one day. Yeah, I know. So there, I'm trying to present everything in my writing, uh, because then people can look at it and th see what they think. It's not like I've, I'm, I'm the most correct person in the world. It, it depends. <laughs> but I'm trying to give people more ways to look at it so they can come up with ways to solve the problems they see. Oh yeah, to get to get them some tools that they can use yeah. in their own uh, experiences. Yeah. Uh, I also got to, since we have time, I uh, also wanted to ask you one more question from, from my reader. Uh, she told me, my mother, she told me about her experience of testing her child uh, with giftedness professionals. So in Poland, we actually have this uh, system of state-funded um, institutions that are... Uh, responsible for testing children, both for giftedness, but mostly for dyslexia, ADD, yeah. uh, autistic spectrum, and, and so on, uh, to make sure that these kids get um, appropriate um, assistance, help, whatever they need uh, right. at schools. But they are state-funded, and so as you can imagine, very often institutions that are state-funded uh, have different quality. But anyway, if you have a gifted child in Poland, you go to this uh, to, to such an institution and uh, get get get, that get him or her tested. So the mother told me that she get her new child uh, tested, but they commented on her son's result in such a way. Do not get so preoccupied with your kid's giftedness. He is only uh, his IQ is only one hundred twenty. We've had kids who were way more gifted than yours. So what do you expect? And she was when she talked about it. She frankly didn't know how to react. She was right. like, <laughs> this is because you don't expect to, to, to hear this, you know, also if your child were uh, on the lower scale, you don't tell somebody we have seen more disadvantaged children than yours, so don't get in, so In my like. first chapter in the book on mm -hmm. relativity, there's a story uh -huh. almost exactly like that. Really? Yes. Okay. But what what can happen is Okay, my PhD is my major was test and measurement. Uh huh. Okay. So you know very and, well what these tests mean, yes, what this yes. course means. And yeah. I helped to norm the WISC 5 and the WIPC 4 and the SB5. Uh -huh. Wow. And I had gifted populations that I worked with for those. And so I'm very familiar with how this all works. And in order to be in those samples, they had to have taken another test that showed they were gifted. And so uh, there's something called a true score. A true score is the average of a hypothetical parallel testing of a thousand times. <laughs> and of course, nobody does that. But you can get anywhere in that continuum and overall, most of your scores will be over your true score. That might be a low score for this child. Also, that's just the full scale score. He may have some very high areas and they ignored them. And so, yeah. I don't I, know which, which test that was, but uh, it might, might have been uh, Stanford PNA because this is what most uh, Polish these institutions use. But that's the whole range of quantitative reasoning, verbal, nonverbal. So, um... but there are ways to um, have the the categories on the S five. There are five main categories in verbal and nonverbal. Yeah, if he had a couple of high ones and a couple of really low ones, he'd have a one hundred twenty. I would not pay attention to that. I would I would look at the child's strengths. Also. One of the things that happens, well, I mean, I know this as the mother as well, 
that uh, if your child is all over the place, you know, they don't sit still and it, the testing person focuses on how they might have ADHD instead of being gifted. And so it, and they think they need medication. And I'm saying if you're a really intelligent little boy, you are going to be all over the place. And I am. it's normal. Not all of them, but I mean, it's not unusual. So uh, she has to, she has to have somebody else uh, talk to her about what the subtest. She may be completely right about his strengths, and he may have some real not strengths. But working memory, by the way, is mm -hmm. not what people think it is. It's, I mean, it can really pull a score down. And if a person is normal, that's actually okay. <laughs> <laughs> if they are uh, an intuitive rather than a sensor, they also, as an intuitive, would rather understand what they're memorizing. So they aren't good at memorizing. Yeah. And so short-term memory things on a test are like, I haven't played that before. You know, they couldn't get So you're saying that basically looking just at the general IQ result as the only one metric that tells you whether a child is gifted or not is the big misunderstanding of the whole testing. I mean, if it's a really high score, it's you know it's a high score. But if if it's an uneven score, we need to know that. You mentioned that some some children get tested for ADD ADHD uh, instead of giftedness because they are so energetic and moving around what i hear from uh from parents of gifted children is some of them uh, have gone through a very sad path of their children being uh, tested for autism even though they the the tests were negative so that the, the autistic spectrum didn't show up on the tests the specialist still wanted to make sure that there is autism indeed and uh, that uh, for one mother and i talked to it was really a very uh, heartbreaking experience but then it turned out that it's not very uncommon uh, that no. very often giftedness gets uh, mistaken with with autism but for parents it's hard to you know persuade the teachers or specialists psychologists and so on that hey it's not autism it's giftedness you know like being in this position is extremely hard what yeah. would your advice be to 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 such parents who struggle with that? Well, first of all, people will ask me. I'll I, I'll tell them. I mean, back when I was giving hundreds and hundreds of tests, I'd say, "I'll tell you if your kid is weird." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I deal with highly gifted to profoundly gifted, uh -huh. and. I mean, it was very rare that anybody came in and scored below 120, and that's because parents know. They know their children are bright. And so children who are the nerdier the child is, the more into narrow areas that get really special at, they can seem odd, but not to each other. Who are like them. Of course. I mean, there are lots of people like that. <laughs> and they function fine. Yeah. And turning it into a disability is nuts, in my opinion. Uh, look at the people who have uh, grown up with dyslexia or dysgraph. Okay, okay. You know, it's like, okay, you're, you're neurologically uh, divergent. That's fine. It makes it easy to choose your career. You're not going to do something you aren't any good at. <laughs> Hire somebody to do that. So, <laughs> people people worry too much about these these quirky behaviors. They're only quirky because, like giftedness, it's unusual. Uh -huh. it doesn't mean there's something wrong. That's how I see it. Yeah. That's uh, no, that's very uh, heartwarming. What you what you are saying, if you live in an environment where you don't see that many people who are accepting about the quirks, 
Um, <laughs> some oddities and so on. It's uh, sometimes you just, you know, get concerned like maybe it is autism or maybe it is ADHD and we should get medications and then therapy or something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of therapy, but that's yeah. for that. It's about nation skills and yeah, that kind of thing. But yeah. Yeah. I, and, but I, I bring all these things are in my writing because it, it, it all comes up and when children when children are allowed to be with others who share their interests and that's hard to arrange if you are stuck with grade level age level and as they get older they will be in more classes and workplaces uh but you'll see in the book and i i am determined to get it out by march Okay. okay, so that's pretty soon, okay? <laughs> yes. Yes, as soon as we get off this uh, call, I'm going to go keep writing. No, so I'm really looking forward to reading. What, what's uh, the title going to be? Oh, uh, let me see if Do I you have the title yet. It's five, five Levels Grown Up, What They Tell Us. Uh, something like that. You know, I, Fantastic. I make creative, uh, creative titles and then I forget what they are. Because with certain personality types... We're so big picture, and for instance, in school, we want to know why are we doing this. Tell me overall result here, and more uh, elementary teachers and more of the population are S sensors, and they just want to know what they're supposed to do in order. Yeah, of course, they, they don't care about the application the same way the intuitive does. The intuitive will say, why are, Why do I need this? Why are we doing it? Yeah. How, how am I going to use it? True. And that's why very often children complain that they don't understand why they should use, you know, the, why they should learn mathematics or why they should learn, you know, spelling and so on. Like when and how would I need it, right, in my future life? Yeah. Well, and you, you do need to be thinking on your feet to give some good answers because they need to know how not to be cheated. That's what I'm telling everybody. Like, you know, if you don't learn that, I can make a fool of you. Well, if you hire somebody to do your accounting or your uh, bill paying or whatever, yeah. and you don't know how to even check and see if and they're verify, doing yeah, that you're vulnerable. You're a fool, exactly. <laughs> so it's all about you know avoiding this vulnerability in the future life. Deborah, I'm so grateful for our meeting today. Thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. And really well, looking forward to the book. Thank you. Thank you. And let me know if there's anything you need after we have talked today, okay? Absolutely, I will.